What's up everybody? This is 2021 Unit 2 Paper 2 Biology ASMR 1A An experiment to observe the interconversions of compounds found in the nitrogen cycle was carried out by a student. 150 cm cube of a solution of urea was mixed with 50 grams of a well aerated loam soil. The ammonium, nitrite, and nitrate concentrations were immediately determined semi-quantitatively by using test strips that produced color changes. The strips were then compared to the specific color scale, which gave a measurement of the ion in parts per million, also called ppm. The mixture was sampled for both ions in 6 hour intervals for 24 hours. So if you look at the graph here, we could see that this is over a 24 hour period with six hour intervals. That is a different type of graph on the x-axis. We have the period of incubation in hours, but on the left side and the right side, we actually have two different scales. So what we have to look at is this little key or legend to tell which ion is which to see the type of plot point. So you'll see the type of diamond shape plot points. This is ammonium. And this would be these here. The steeper line graph. And nitrite ions are represented by triangular points. Which would be these here that are going up. Plateauing, going up again. When we read in the graph, we'll have to read the respective axes. So on the y-axis on the left, this is the ammonium. The y-axis on the right, this is the nitrite. Okay, so here we have a better look at the graph. And what I've marked here, well, let me get rid of this line. Okay, so here we have a better look at the graph. And just for the sake of visibility, I've marked the ammonium ion line graph in blue. And the nitrite ion remains in black. The table you can see on the right it shows the production of ammonium and nitrite ions over a 24 period of incubation in loam soil with a solution of urea. So you have to ensure that you have a title. This one might be a little too lengthy but it never hurts to put as much detail as it could. You can easily make the table title on the graph title. On the table we have the period of incubation for every six hour period of the 24 hours, starting with zero. And on the right, we have concentration in parts per million, the ammonium and the nitrite ions. Now remember, when you're reading the ammonium, you have to read from the left of the y-axis, and the nitrite, you read from the right of the y-axis. So it's not hard to read the table. So if we start, for example, from zero, We could see the well the triangle is gonna be the nitrate, so that's zero we see in here, and the ammonium is gonna be 30. And we can continue doing this. For example, if we look at the 24 hour period, right? We could see that the ammonium, which is blue, is gonna be eight hundred. The nitrite is going to be 200 right, for the 18-hour period. We can see for the ammonium that this is 400. And for the nitrite, this is 100. So it's not hard. Make sure that you have everything stated properly and make sure that you start from zero. Let's look at the other part of question one. A diagram of a simplified nitrogen cycle involving plants and a natural ecosystem as shown in figure 2. So here we can see five processes A, B, C, D, E and they say identify the processes labeled A to E in figure 2. Well A is going to be decomposition. This is where the living plants are going to break down the organic matter is decomposed by bacteria and fungi and all of the nitrogen is going to return to the soil. 
Now B is going to be ammonification, where that nitrogen is with this putrefied material is going to turn into ammonia, ammonium ions. And then C, this is going to be a nitrate, and this is going to be nitrification. You're going to have nitrifying bacteria. For example, nitrobacter, nitrosomnus, is going to convert this, these ammonium ions into nitrates and then nitrates. D, we're going to have denitrification, where these nitrates, well, some of them are going to be taken up into plants, like for growth, but some of them are going to be converted back into atmospheric nitrogen through denitrifying bacteria. So E, this atmospheric nitrogen, will be absorbed into plants through bacteria in the soil or roots called rhizobium, which is a type of nitrogen-fixing bacteria. So that's going to convert it into a more usable form to be in the plant. And so this is called E, is called nitrogen fixation. So if you look at part three, animals may also be involved in the nitrogen cycle. Extend the diagram in figure two to illustrate the involvement of animals in the nitrogen cycle. So I'll show you the diagram once more. But plants are consumed by animals, and then those animals would either excrete that nitrogen through urine, or they would die and decompose, and that would release urea and organic nitrogen material compounds into the soil. So here you can see it once again. The plants are consumed by animals, so nitrogen compounds get assimilated into their cells, and they would either excrete this nitrogenous waste back into the, the soil, or they would die and putrefy and be returned to the soil that way, the nitrogen. Let's look at one part B. Energy is needed to metabolize nitrogen compounds within organisms. Under anaerobic conditions, that means without oxygen, the respiratory pathway differs depending on the organism. Part 1. State two similarities between fermentation, anaerobic respiration reactions in animals, and yeast. Well, we need to just list two, so any two of these would do. Well, both reactions occur in the absence of oxygen. Both reactions involve glycolysis and the conversion of glucose into pyruvate. So, one thing to note here is that because there is no oxygen, Oxygen is usually the end, you can think of it as the end of the electron transport chain and thus the, the final receiver of the electrons in that chain and thus for the entire respiratory process after the Krebs cycle. So if the oxygen is not there, it's kind of like the, it cannot, the process cannot move forward from glycolysis. So all that ATP from the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain cannot be produced. That includes water because the oxygen binds with hydrogen there to become water. So only two ATPs are produced in both reactions because this is in glycolysis. Question two for three marks. Explain the function of fermentation reactions in organism. Well, fermentation reactions allow the production of pyruvate. And pyruvate is a three carbon sugar, an ATP in the absence of oxygen. Now, since oxygen is not involved, pyruvate cannot enter the Krebs cycle because there's no oxygen at the end of the electron transport chain. Glycolysis must be continued to keep producing a small amount of ATP. This is done by regenerating the electron carriers when pyruvate converts to its products, such as lactate, NADH is oxidized to reform NAD. So NADH is basically reduced NAD. This NAD plus can then be used to reinitiate the glycolysis stage of fermentation. So we have a lot to talk here about um, the electron transport chain and lack of oxygen. And I just wanted to explain this here. So here we have NADH. And this is basically 
NAD with a hydrogen attached to it. And you could think of this as NAD being reduced. So what happens here is that this leaps forward and takes out this hydrogen. So this hydrogen ion gets released. I like to think of NADH as a glove or catcher's mitt that has a ball of hydrogen in it. And what is ready to do? It is ready to sort of toss out that hydrogen ion at any time. And when it tosses out that hydrogen ion, that NADH loses that H and becomes NAD+. Right? So that's when it gets reoxidized. So coming back here now, this hydrogen ion gets tossed out and we get electrons moving across protein carriers in the electron transport chain. So this is going to jump like this to A, boom, to B, boom, to C. And what's going to be at the end of this chain is going to be an oxygen molecule. It's going to receive this electron and that's going to help well, actually, it's going to be two electrons, and that's going to help to bind these two hydrogen ions to this oxygen. And that's guess what we're going to get. We're going to get H2 and one oxygen atom, O, and that's going to be water. But if this oxygen atom is not here, none of these processes could happen. You could think of it like a circuit where the oxygen is kind of like the switch for the circuit. So if the oxygen is not there, and if this is like a series circuit, it's kind of like you're opening the switch and no electrons could flow and basically no energy. None of these processes could happen here. So if you were to take another look at this, we could see that NADH, and this occurs in the matrix, right? So this tosses out its hydrogen and becomes NAD, right? So it reoxidizes. The electron is being released. And this is going to bounce, boom, from carrier to carrier, boom, to the next carrier, boom, until it attaches to the oxygen. And what's going to have what that's going to enable because these electrons now have energy, right? As this has energy now, it's going to allow hydrogen, all a whole bunch of hydrogen ions to move across the membrane. So all of these are going to be shooting up here like little bullets, right? So they're going to be coming up, these protein carriers because the, the electron supplies energy as it bounces from protein to protein. Now, what in the end, what's going to happen is some of these hydrogen ions, right? So imagine like they're going to diffuse back down. Two of them are going to combine with this oxygen molecule to form water. So let's look at C. The process for oxidative phosphorylation is very important for the supply of respiratory energy under aerobic conditions. Discuss the importance of the following components of oxidative phosphorylation. So let me just break down this word here. Oxidative, of course, comes from oxidize, which means the use of oxygen. And phosphorylation, to phosphorylate something just means to add phosphate groups. So what is being phosphorylated is ADP would then be added phosphate group to turn into ATP. So one, the formation of a proton gradient. So a proton gradient here would be a bunch of hydrogen ions. Right, so let me read here. Electrons formed due to reduced NAD and FAD. This is basically NADH and FADH2 shuttle along the electron transport chain and provide energy for hydrogen pumps along the mitochondrial inner membrane and intermembrane space.
the intermembrane develops a more positive charge, allowing the hydrogen ions to diffuse back down to the inner membrane. This is called chemiosmosis. It's not, it actually has nothing to do with osmosis, but basically it goes from when there's a, a think of it like a greater concentration of hydrogen ions to a lower while passing through channels with ATP synthases. So an ATP synthase or ATPase is a type of enzyme that allows the formation of ATP from ADP. So ATP synthase is what would actually phosphorylate ADP, right? It would add a phosphate group to it. So if you look here, what is happening is this NADH, think of this like a glove with a hydrogen ball in it is going to toss out that hydrogen and it's going to reoxidize to form NAD+. So that hydrogen, or I'm going to have a bunch of these, I just joined one. And this hydrogen is going to be here. So there's a hydrogen ion. So electrons are also going to be released. So you're also going to have a bunch of hydrogen ions here. This is also going to happen with FADH2. When it gets reoxidized to FAD, think of this as an even more powerful um, catches mid that's tossing out two hydrogen balls and two electrons. So what else is happening here is the electron gets shuttled across the electron transport chain. So this is going to bounce like boop, boop, boop. And this, this electron here has energy in it. And that energy is being used to think of it like activate or open hydrogen ion channels. So what's going to happen now is a bunch of hydrogen ions are going to get shuttled across from here. So that's basically going to be these. So they're going to get shuttled across here. And this is going to create a proton gradient where here you're going to have much more a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So what's going to happen next is that these electrons are going to keep shuttling along the carriers and they're going to end and the final molecule to receive the electron is going to be oxygen. And when that happens, two hydrogen ions are going to bond to that oxygen and that there is going to make H2O or water. This is where the water comes from in respiration. Now what will happen here now is up here you're going to have a high concentration of hydrogen ions and the chemiosmosis is basically going to allow the flow of these hydrogen ions through these compounds called ATP synthases. This is going to synthesize ATP. So it's going to phosphorylate the ADP, add a phosphate group to it, and turn it into ATP. And that's how you get ATP. So discuss the importance of the synthesis of ATP. Well, ATP is required during glycolysis. You need to actually produce ATP. Well, we know ATP is the energy currency of life and is required for any metabolic reaction in living organisms like growth, movement, irritability, and so on. And it's synthesized by ATP synthase enzymes along the cristate as the folds of the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Of course, without ATP, the body will not have enough energy. You become fatigued and cell death will occur. Eventually, the organism would die. But um, just to go through here, we need, actually need an ATP to restart the whole respiratory process. Because remember, that starts with glycolysis. And glycolysis, we need to phosphorylate glucose to form, or you need to phosphorylate it twice. And this here actually uses two ATPs to form fructose biphosphate. This is basically just adding two phosphate groups to the glucose and isomerizing it. So it becomes fructose biphosphate, which is unstable, and that breaks down into, eventually into pyruvate. It breaks down into triose phosphates and eventually into pyruvate. Pyruvate then enters the Krebs cycle where 
you would get all these NADs being reduced to form NADH. Basically, the catcher's mitt NAD is going to catch a bunch of hydrogen atoms and become NADH, ready to be released. Think of it like it's a buildup of potential energy. This allows the release of electrons into the electron transport chain and allows the formation of even more ATP. In fact, a net gain of 32 ATP is formed in the end. But two ATP is required to actually start the process. Finally, discuss the role of oxygen. So oxygen, we just discussed, must be present to receive the electrons along the electron transport chain. Oxygen is like a switch for the whole, the whole system. Imagine it is a series circuit and oxygen is not there. It is like a missing component and thus no electrons could flow through that chain. And Krebs cycle cannot occur and no water could be formed. And you can't form all of that 32 ATP in the end. So what the oxygen does is that it um, maintains the hydrogen pumps. This is the energy from the electrons. It maintains the hydrogen pumps and the formation of the electrochemical gradient. So this is needed um, for production of ATP by ATP synthase. Because all of those hydrogen ions have to flow down the ATP synthase to supply it with energy. So it could convert ADP to ATP to phosphorylate ADP, basically. Oxygen molecules eventually combine with H plus ions and electrons to form water molecules. Let's look at question two. Figure three shows a motor neuron in the spinal cord of an ox from a light micrograph. So here we could see the light micrograph and they say in the space below construct an annotated diagram of the motor neuron provided in figure 3. Show the magnification of your drawing. Well I didn't actually draw it, I was a little too lazy. So I just labeled the uh, micrograph instead. I mean it's not a terribly hard drawing though. And here we have the nucleolus in the center. The dendrites that are coming out of the cell body. And this long process here, extended process, is called the axon. And around it, we have the myelin sheath, which acts as an insulator. Here we have the annotations. Feel free to give it a look. And since I didn't actually do the drawing, I couldn't do the magnification. But again, it's not terribly hard. What you have to do is just say, use the image size over the object size. I remember there is no unit in magnification. State 2, this is part 2. State 2, main function of synapses. So to explain what is a synapse, a synapse is a small gap between um, two neurons. And a neurotransmitter is usually used to connect the electrical signal between two neurons, basically to allow the passage of an action potential. So what synapses do is that they stop the constant conduction of action potentials. So what they do is that they kind of regulate the transmission of action potentials and they allow directed transmission. So for example, now you can have about 10 dendrites, for example, but maybe not all 10 need to be activated. So only neurotransmitters might be secreted from two or three of them. If you have to concentrate an action on, let me say, one particular muscle, rather than all the muscles at once um, in a certain part of your body. Another part, another main function of it is summation. And this allows many tiny electrical impulses to have a cumulatory effect to allow multiple possible signal pathways. So to explain what it is, imagine that you're driving a car. And when you're driving that car, you have to make decisions very quickly so for example, if you have to turn left or turn right somewhere, you might be prepared to do either one. You also have to keep your foot on the accelerator and the brake. You also have to keep your eyes on the road, the rear view and the side window. And you might be somehow doing something else at the same time. What synapses do is allow, is allow the, the transmission to be directed to each pathway and be prepared to at least switch pathways very quickly. That is called summation. Part 3. Outline the sequence of events that occurs when an action potential reaches a synapse. 
So I'm read here and I'll show you as I go along. The action potential, remember this is like the electrical impulse, this would reach the axon of the neuron. Now since this has energy in it, uh, it would open voltage gated channels. These channels would open, these would be sodium and calcium channels to allow ions to enter the presynaptic bulb's cytoplasm. This would allow the movement of vesicles towards the synaptic cleft. The synaptic cleft is basically the gap between what you call the presynaptic bulb and the postsynaptic membrane, right? Because there's, there's basically a neuron before and a neuron after, so pre and, and post. Now the vesicles, which are basically like tiny little packets inside, this, um, inside the presynaptic bulb in the neuron, these contain a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And these vesicles would move towards the presynaptic membrane and allow ex and, and via exocytosis, they would sort of release that neurotransmitter into the gap. Now receptors on the postsynaptic membrane that will be the neuron that will be after the current neuron would allow acetylcholine to bind to them. Now when the acetylcholine binds, this allows sodium ions to enter the postsynaptic cytoplasm. Depolarization, which is a whole story by itself, and I'm going to get into it here, would then occur. And just to briefly explain what this means, depolarization, usually when the neuron is at rest, the inside of the neuron is, is negative. But depolarization allows it to be temporarily positive. This little change in charge here allows the action potential to continue. Now you have an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. You could guess what that is. That is just an enzyme that would break down acetylcholine. And that breaks it down into two substances, acetate and choline. And the choline part of that actually reforms acetylcholine so the entire um, process could be restarted after returning to the synaptic bulb. Let's look at B. Plants possess co-transporter proteins within cell membranes that move two molecules at the same time. One molecule is transported along or down the concentration gradient that means high to low which releases energy that is used to transport the other molecule against its concentration gradient. So they said now differentiate between the source and sink in relation to phloem transport. Well, a source is basically something that would make sugar. So it's a photosynthetic organ capable of producing sugars, in this case here, glucose, in excess for transport. The glucose is then um, forms into a disaccharide called sucrose, and sucrose is unloaded from the sources into the phloem. Example of sources would be leaves because they have chlorophyll. Now sugars from sources are loaded into the phloem and are sent to sinks because sinks are non-photosynthetic organs. That means that they don't have chlorophyll and they don't produce sugars, so they have to have sugars delivered to them, uh, for example, for storage or for energy. So sucrose is loaded into the sinks from the phloem. Example of sinks would be roots, for example, because those are buried beneath the ground where they cannot obtain sunlight and there's no growth. Part 2. Explain how the sieve elements of the phloem are loaded with solutes against a concentration gradient. Well, solutes are loaded into the phloem by active transport. An active transport we know needs ATP. The ATP helps those those molecules move against a concentration gradient. So ATP is needed to transport the solutes. So using ATP, hydrogen ions are pumped out of companion cells. Companion cells are found adjacent to phloem tube elements. Companion cells usually are loaded with mitochondria and help supply ATP and energy to the um, phloem elements, phloem tube elements. So as hydrogen ions move back, into the companion cell via transport proteins, sucrose moves in with them through a protein trans co-transporter. Um, to put this in simple terms, imagine that when those hydrogen ions begin flowing through those transport proteins, the gate sort of remains open 
and sucrose could move with it so it's kind of like the sucrose is seeing the gate open hydrogen ions open the gate and sucrose was like hey look the gate open let me move in too so it kind of gets transported together and you just call that well symport okay let's look at c figure four shows the movement of substances through the xylem well the phloem and xylem on the left we have the phloem on the right we have the xylem and we have seven parts labeled one two three four five six seven on this on each side of the xylem and the phloem we have the leaf cells the root cells we have the soil below here and we have the atmosphere where evaporation is going to occur or transpiration i should say discuss the mass flow theory as a mechanism of sugar transport in the phloem your response must include the processes labeled 1 to 7 and the movement of substances as indicated by the arrows so let's take a look at what is happening here so at 1 right here we'll see that this deals with the phloem and something is coming out from the leaf cells into the phloem so to look at it here solute is loaded into the phloem via active transport this was explained in the previous question with the hydrogen ions and the co-transport of sucrose through the proteins so what this does is that this allows sucrose to be pumped into the sieve tube thus decreasing the water potential there well, basically what this means is that there is a higher concentration of solute and thus a lower concentration of water now if you look at two because here has a lower water potential as well l here for lower and of course in the xylem we have transpiration or pull of water molecules from the soil so all of this is water particles moving up here we are going to have a higher concentration of water molecules here right or you think of it as a higher water potential so that's going to allow water to get pushed, be pushed from the xylem to the phloem. So as a result, osmosis occurs, causing water flow, water to flow from the xylem to the phloem. And what this does at tree is that this water is going to push the solute downwards. So this is going to create a hydrostatic pressure that pushes the solute through the sieve tube. And this is going to be called mass flow. So not necessarily um like diffusion or, or sugars dissolving is basically going to act as a pressure to allow bulk flow of the sucrose down from the source to the sink. Remember the roots now, the roots require sucrose because they cannot undergo photosynthesis. So at four, as the solutes, solute reaches the sink, the sucrose is unloaded from the phloem. And what this does, because solute is moving into the root cells that is called s here for solute the water potential over here is going to get higher for little h here to show that the water potential has increased there's a higher concentration of water molecules here because a lot of the solute now has gone into the roots now water is coming in from the soil into the roots via osmosis but water is also being pushed from the phloem into the xylem. So here has a lower water potential and that's going to allow water to flow from the phloem into the xylem. So five, water is absorbed from the soil into the xylem, that's via the roots. And six, the increased water potential in the phloem because a lot of the solid went into the roots allows water to flow into the base of the xylem via osmosis. This, of course, would create um, extra pressure that will help with transpiration of pull and allow water molecules to move upwards to the leaves. So seven, which is where you see in the water is flowing up. Right, so you do five, six, and seven. Transpiration of pull, capillarity, and root pressure all contribute to the movement of water 
of the narrow xylem tubes. The ad adhesive and cohesive forces of water also assist. Adhesive means the water molecules can easily stick to the sides of the xylem walls and cohesive means that the water molecules can easily be attracted to each other to form a long chain. Now it should be noted that the mass flow theory only accounts for unidirectional movement of solute in the phloem. What this means is that it really only allows flow, the theory only allows flow from uh, the source to the sink and in this case here downwards but it actually flows in multiple directions. So there may be more about this that we have yet to discover. So of course this is a whopping 12 marks. So you want to make sure and have all your details, the descriptions of every single part labeled here and have it linked together cohesively. Let's look at question 3. A. Monoclonal antibodies are used in the early testing for pregnancy. Figure 3 shows a strip from a home pregnancy test kit. There are three areas in each strip where reactions occur. And here we could see, well, this is the urine and this is the dipstick, the home pregnancy test strip. And we could see three regions being labeled. We'll come back to this just now. We have um, a region one, which contains monoclonal antibodies that are made in a mouse. Two, we have um, different types of antibodies and some dye. And region three, there's anti-mouse antibodies and dye. So the question here is define the term monoclonal antibody and to read the definition here a monoclonal antibody is an antibody made by cloning a unique B lymphocyte which you know usually can't um, reproduce. It is a form of artificial passive immunity. Now, usually how these are formed is that um, they are infused with a tumor cell or a cancer cell to form a new type of cell called a hybridoma we know uh, well cancer cells are very good at dividing so these monoclonal antibodies are able to divide very fast replicate very fast um, in case of certain diseases where person's immune response is compromised um, they can be injected with monoclonal antibodies to extend it's kind of like sending in reinforcements to fight a certain pathogen an example would it be COVID-19 figure 6 is a representation of the reactions that occur in the home pregnancy test strip and here we can see three reactions A, B and C we have a little key to show you different parts of these diagrams the triangle is a human chorionic gonadotropin molecule HCG HCG is produced by the blastocyst which comes from a fertilized egg. So HCG is actually the hormone that would signal, be the signal to tell if a woman is pregnant or not. A, preg a woman who's not pregnant wouldn't have a fertilized egg being implanted and thus would not produce HCG. We have a colored dye. This might be blue or pink, for example. We have anti-mouse antibodies and different antibodies and we can tell them by the thickness of the um, different regions. The anti-mouse antibody doesn't really have any tick regions. And then we have monoclonal antibody with its tick throughout, at least based on the diagram. And this is fitted with an enzyme, which is where you seen as E, to activate the dye. So the question here is to identify the areas labeled 1 to 3 on figure 5, where reactions A, B, and C in figure 6 occur. So reaction A is region 3, reaction B is region 1, and reaction C is region 2. Well, let's take a closer look at it. So here we could have a better look at both diagrams. And let's look at one. So one contains monoclonal antibodies made in a mouse. So what we want to have is these monoclonal antibodies throughout. And that's how we're able to tell that this region 1 is actually reaction B. So what's happening here is the HCG from the pregnant woman, pregnant woman's urine, is binding to these monoclonal antibodies made in the mouse. So region 2 contains many different types of antibodies and dye. So what's going to happen here now is that because the, there's an enzyme attached to it, the enzyme can now 
activate the dye molecules, which is what might be like a blue, might appear as a blue line, for example. So this window here is going to tell you if the woman is pregnant, because if there's HCG bound right to, to, to these enzymes, to these um, monoclonal antibodies made in the mouse that activates the dye, this is going to signal that a woman is pregnant. So that will be this window here too, and this will be the line to show that a woman is pregnant. Now the pregnancy um, home test strip actually has a control to tell you if the if the um, if it is working or not. Now typically, if a woman urinates on it, a line would show up anyway. So, for example, if you end up with um, no line showing up, it means that the pregnancy test strip something is wrong with it. So, three is actually the control window. And what this has is anti-mouse antibodies and dye. And this here, this reaction A, this is gonna this is gonna bind the dye anyway. And it's gonna bind anti-mouse antibodies to this. And it that means that it does it doesn't actually need the HCG bound to the anti-mouse antibodies or to the um, I'm sure to the monoclonal antibodies. So notice that there's no HCG here. So none is actually needed for the control. This line would show up anyway. So once again, to explain, outline the processes which will occur in each label area. If the pregnancy test is positive, one, this zone interacts with urine. If HCG is found in the urine, it is bound to the monoclonal antibodies there. No dye is being bound yet. So there'll be no line in this region. Two, the HCG bound antibodies are carried here. So because there's HCG on it, on those particular antibodies with the enzyme, the enzyme will be bound to dye to activate the dye. And that is what's gonna produce the line. So the dye is activated to produce a colored line indicating positive pregnancy. So three, which is the control window, this contains anti-mouse antibodies and those will also bind to the dye activating it whether there's hcg on there or not it doesn't need hcg to, to activate this dye here so this would result in another colored line so if a woman is pregnant there will be two typically there will be two colored lines if there's only one colored line in region three that means that the woman is not pregnant and if there's no colored line at all that means that the pregnancy tests something is wrong with it it is it is flawed or defective. Let's look at question 3 part B. Research has shown that maternal smoking has harmful effects on fetal and infant health. Table 1 shows the cigarette smoking habits of a group of pregnant women in the United States of America in 2014 based on age and level of education. Now on the table we can see certain maternal characteristics such as the age, age groups such as the level of education whether it's less than high school education or person has a bachelor's degree or higher and we have the prevalence of cigarette smoking habits among pregnant women in the USA at any time during pregnancy and whether they quit during pregnancy and here we have certain percentages so the question says on the grid provided on page 19 construct a bar graph based on the data provided in table 1 this is what the graph is going to look like. On your y-axis, you're going to have prevalence in smoking habits among pregnant women in terms of percentage. On the x-axis, you're going to have the maternal characteristics, the age groups, and the level of education, less than high school or bachelor's degree or higher. And this is going to be a bar graph, of course. And you want to have a key or a legend. In my case, I could have color coded, but you would put stripes on one and leave the other one blank. And make sure that you have a title for your graph and ensure that uh, your graph occupies at least half of the grid on each side. So this is the two conclusions which can be drawn from the data in table one. Well, from the table at least, um, college educated women, those are, those are bachelor's degrees, are much more likely to quit smoking during pregnancy than those with less than a high school education, despite having the smallest percentage of pregnant smokers. And two, 
younger smokers are slightly more likely to quit smoking during pregnancy than older smokers. And this could be maybe due to, you know, they're not that addicted to nicotine yet, so it's, it's easier for them to quit. That should be and. Three, suggest one measure that would be effective in reducing the prevalence of cigarette smoking. Um, nicotine patches help to reduce um, addiction or dependency. And we also have awareness programs to show dangers of tobacco. You get ads like this running on um, YouTube and television all the time. And here we have uh, C. This is the last question. This is a whopping 12 marks. Nicotine is a drug which is present in cigarette smoke. Cigarette smoking can lead to development of chronic diseases. Discuss three ways in which the nicotine in cigarette smoke can lead to the development of cardiovascular diseases. This could be like coronary heart disease or hypertension, for example. Um, you want to have three very well-developed points for four marks each. So one, nicotine constricts blood vessels. This causes a reduced lumen size and thus increased blood pressure and can lead to hypertension. You could also have a greater possibility of having atherosclerotic plaques um, building up in those artery lumens. And this greatly increases the possibility of a thrombosis or a blood clot. And this could possibly re result in a heart attack. Two, nicotine is a stimulant that closely um, resembles acetylcholine, which remember is a neurotransmitter. Nicotine can bind to receptors and synapses and cannot be broken down by acetylcholine esterase. So you could think of it, 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 it is kind of like a, a, a competitive inhibitor where if you introduce it into the system, um, acetylcholine is not going to be as effective. So as a result, this causes the synapse to continuously fire action potentials and this raises heart rate and blood pressure, event leading, leading to hypertension. And the last one, nicotine may cause cells to increase insulin resistance. As a result, glucose cannot bind to cell receptors to activate GLUT4 proteins to transport them through the membrane. This can lead to type 2 diabetes, which in turn leads to nerve damage. And nerve damage can damage the heart's sinoatrium node. And this affects heart rate and possibly leads to cardiac arrest. And that is it for this paper. Take care.